So my topic for this afternoon is winning the city. Winning the city. We bless God for how far he has brought the church of Pentecost. However, we still have the future to live and the future to take. We need to continue to stay relevant as a church so that we will remain glorious as a body moving forward. We have to remain glorious as a body moving forward. We, should, we shouldn't be first today and last tomorrow. No, may the Lord forbid. And so as we are moving on, we need to be thinking about the future, how this church will stay re relevant and continue to win souls and be a glorious church. So this afternoon, I'll be discussing ministry in the city ministry in the city i shall attempt to underscore the importance of city ministry and how we should adapt to the challenges of the city to continue to stay relevant and effective in the coming years in genesis chapter 4 verse 17 that is um, the first mention of the city in Genesis 4, 17, the Bible first mentioned city. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. So Cain was the first person to build a city, to build a city. And so... Please take note of that. Now when we say we talk about the city, we mean a large or important town. A large or important town. Sometimes, some of the cities are referred to as principal or chief cities. Like, for their importance, like New York, London, they are principal cities. Principal cities. Because of their importance and sometimes their bigness. City is also a major metropolitan center or of a religion, of a region, as you say, and it is, and in its inhabitants, especially in its culture, is sophistication or in accepting or combining a wide variety of people and ideas. They are often characterized by high population density, congestion, and a fast-paced lifestyle. At the turn of the 21st century, Harvey Cox, a Harvard theologian, was quoted to have said, and I want to quote it, the whole world has become one immense city. Unquote. The whole world has become one immense city. The statement of Roger Greenway, a former missionary to Mexico and Sri Lanka, is most striking. He said, The only conclusion we can reach, the only conclusion we can reach is that at no time in history, has it been more true than now that he who wins the city wins the world? He who wins the city wins the world. He didn't say, just say it yesterday. He said it many years ago. And so we need to look at the city, try to win the city, because he who wins the city wins the world. Today, most people live in the city. And the trend towards the city is likely to continue. We therefore need to acknowledge the importance of city ministry. If we are going to be serious about the Great Commission as a church and still stay relevant in the coming years, we must be serious about reaching the cities with effective ministries and the cities provide avenues for all sorts of ministries. 
it looks to me that the cities were strategic targets in Paul's ministry. Why am I saying this? Ask chapter 20, verse 23, that, that the cities were strategic targets in Paul's ministry. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. I only know that in every city. Now you could have said that I only know that in every town, village. But it looks to me that he was much more concerned with cities and working within the cities. That is why you might have said this. So the names and places we, most, we are most familiar with in scripture are mainly provinces and cities. Especially in the book of Acts, when we are talking about Joppa, Antioch, Ephesus. Even the epistles were written to people in provinces or in particular cities like Ephesus, Corinth, Rome. Now, so city ministry is very strategic. And the church of Pentecost, you rise to take the cities for the Lord. If indeed cities were strategic targets in Paul's ministry, then it should be ours also for the simple reason that he was an effective Christian worker. Now, so if he targeted cities, then we should try and follow suit because of who he was, very effective Christian worker. What is creating cities? Many. But let me try and give one or two. I'm now going to look at global urbanization. While the rural contests remain important to church planting today, more than 56% of the world's inhabitants live in the urban areas. More than 56%. So we are not discarding rural ministry. Wherever human beings are, we will go for them. But 56% of the inhabitants of this planet, they live in the urban centers. And this is expected to grow rapidly. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development predicts that by 2050, over 70% of the human population will live in the urban centers. Rural urban migration has become a significant trend in many developing countries, including Ghana. The phenomenon involves the movement of individuals or household from rural areas to urban centers in search for better employment opportunities improved living conditions, and access to essential services. Understanding the pattern and implication of rural urban migration is crucial for the Church of Pentecost as we seek to possess the nations. Now, I want to look at some comparative analysis of rural urban population or rural urban drift. I'll take, I'll use Ghana as an example. And those of us in the other nations, you can do some, uh, your own analysis. Because the trend is the same, try and then look at yours in this light. Rural urban population of Ghana, I'll look at from 1990 to 2021. In 1990, the Ghanaian population in the rural setting was 9 million plus. The urban population was 5 million plus. And the rural ratio was 60, 64%. And then the urban ratio was 36. Now, in 2000, 10 years later, 10,000, 10, plus lived in the rural setting. 8 million plus were found in the urban centers. Let's come to 
2010. In 2010, look at the figures. 12,213 12, in the rural setting. And then 12,566 plus in the urban setting. So by 2010, the trend had changed. More people were now found in the urban areas than in the rural setting. In 2020, 2020, 13 million plus were found in the rural areas. 17 million plus were found in the urban centers. Now, in 2021, the National Population Centers census this is the figures as it stands now 13 million seven hundred and ninety four thousand seven hundred and ninety eight are found in the rural areas and then 19 million plus in the urban centers so look at the trend so this is not going to reverse it is going to continue what are the implications of this for our ministry as a church for our ministry as a church. Now, from the above, yes, so from 1990 to 2021, the rural population keeps decreasing, while the urban population keeps increasing steadily. From about 36% in 1990, the urban population has sagged to about 58%. Suggesting that the next 20 years, Ghana could have about 70% of her population as urban dwellers. As urban dwellers. This calls for a unique approach to ministry in the urban centers. We want to look at the push and pull factors. What is pushing people to the city? And what, or what is pulling them in? What is pushing people out of the rural areas? And what is pulling people into the cities? So I'll look at the pull and the push factors. Several push and pull factors contribute to rural urban migration in Ghana. The factors that push people away from rural areas into the urban centers include, I'll just give four each. Number one limited employment opportunities is that true yes number two inadequate access to quality education and health care is that true yes number three resource constraints that one is true and then lower living standards Lower living standards. And nobody wants to be in such an environment. No one wants to be there. Now let's turn to the effect. Let's turn to the effect of the rural urban drift on the overall population. Okay, let me look at the pool factors. What is pulling people into the city? Factors attracting individuals to urban areas include promise of better employment prospects. Improved infrastructure, access to education and health care, high standard of living. So these are some of the factors that, that, that are pulling people into the urban centers. Now, we want to look at the impact on the COP. We'll, we'll, then let's go to, let me just dwell on Greater Accra. Uh, we will look at the overall population in Greater Accra and its implications on the COP even in Greater Accra. The total Church of Pentecost population in Ghana is 3.7 million plus. The Greater Accra areas have a total population of 648,538, representing 17 plus percent. The population in, in the rest of the areas sum up to 3 million plus, representing 82.6% as of June 2023. And so majority of us work among the rural setting. Majority of us work outside um, Greater Accra. 
17% Greater Accra, 82.6% outside Greater Accra. Church of Pentecost population, COP Greater Accra population, 17.4%. Other COP, I've said population is about 82%. Now, as of 2021, the population and housing census, the total population of Ghana in Ghanaians in the Greater Accra region was 5 million plus. Total population of Ghanaians in the Greater Accra region was 5 million plus. The percentage of Church of Pentecost membership in Greater Accra to the population of Ghanaians in the Greater Accra is 11.9, let's say 12%. 12%. Now, um, in 2021 census, it shows that 58% of Ghanaians live in the urban areas. Proportion of the population that is in urban in the greater Accra, greater Accra, we, still we have urban and rural. There, there's rural Accra and then there's urban Accra. And about 91% of the people are in the urban Accra, Accra, Accra proper. And so there are certain places we call Accra, which is not proper Accra. It is still rural. About 91.7% about of them are there. Now I'm going to look at the finances of the areas in greater Accra vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the areas. Now we have said that only 13 of the areas, 13 of the 77 areas are in greater Accra. Now the actual ties that was paid in 2022 by just the 13 areas as against the quantum we all received is 43.9%. If you like, 44% of the ties we pay comes from the 13 areas in Accra. Now the rest of the areas, let's, this is 2022. So the rest of the 76 areas, that is 63 of us, paid 56%. 56, 13, 44, 63, 56. Now let's come to um, mid-year, June 2023. 13 areas paid 47.4, 47.4. So as at mid-year 2023, 63 areas together paid 52.6% of our total times. From the above statistics, it is clear that ministry in the urban centers, especially in Greater Accra, must be taken seriously. Why? Top of the list of reasons is that of urbanization. People are moving to greater Accra and greater Kumasi, a phenomenon that is not likely to, to stop. Now, secondly, as a church, for our central administration system's sake, we need to work hard to support others in the hinterlands. Now, if greater Accra 13 areas are generating 47% of our tithes. And we know that we run a central administration. And so when people are in greater Accra, they have to work very hard to support those in their hinterlands. And it is becoming like that because people are moving to the city centers. And in fact, apart from that, um, there are so many banks in Accra that you cannot even find in Kumasi. How much less Loloto? Yeah. And so you can't find banks there. And so what it means is that when people are doing business even in Kumasi, they will begin from there. Even prophets, even prophets know that they have to start from Kumasi, but they have to come and end in Accra. Because when you come to Accra and you're a business person, you end about five times more what you used to end in Kumasi. So people are moving to Accra. So there's a lot of concentration of population and then also wealth in Accra. Now, 
So the mentality towards ministry in the urban centers should be like this. Those of you who are in the cities, it should be like this. If for any reason uh, you have come to Accra or Kumasi and your elders have told you that uh, here you have to build and then somehow they came to tell you that they found a land for you, they've already paid, please ask them the source. Don't just be happy. Ask them the source. And when they say they are building for you little by little, by the time you leave Accra, they would have finished. Ask them the source. Don't play ostrich to that. Because many a times, they will be using the church's money to be building your house. But we run a central administration. The fact that there is money in Accra, Kumasi, does not mean that the money should go to you as a person. Because at the end of the month, we pay all of you equally. Think about your brothers in Lonto. Think about them. And so the ministry in the urban centers should be like this. Second Samuel chapter 10, verse 9 through 12. Second Samuel chapter 10, 9 through 12. Joab saw that there were battle lines in front of him and behind him. So he selected some of the best troops in Israel and deployed them against the Arameans. The next verse. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and deployed them against the Ammonites. 11. Pay attention to what Joab is going to say. Joab said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you are to come to my rescue. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I'll come to your rescue. Now, verse 12, the big one. Be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. So when you are in greater Accra and you are a district pastor, you are an area head, you see that the people who are contributing a lot of money it is all because of the successes are provided and the reasons we are provided. Now, work very hard because you are working for the entire Church of Pentecost. So when you see that you are trying to meet your target, work harder and let it overflow because it is going to support the work in the visa where all the cocoa farms are dying and the people are moving away from there. Now, we had to do some research recently because we realized that we need to get involved in this replanting of the cocoa trees because we, in the midst of the cocoa trees, we have our church buildings there. Now, if all these farmers leave those places and then they come to Accra, our church buildings will remain in the forest without occupants. And people will not say that because of our church house, they should stay hungry. No. And so we need to not just preach the gospel to them. We need to be, think of their livelihood. Let's get involved in the replanting. Let's encourage them to stay and replant. And so please, all this is part of our work now. Those days when the areas in Sehu were not doing well, uh, January, February, March, we'll pardon them. June, we'll pardon them. Because we know that from October. Yeah. But these days, the, that arithmetic is not working that much. Because the cocoa farms, some of them, they have cardiac cocoa farms and they've sold the land to Galamse uh, workers. And then after many years of planting, we also realized that Ghana as a whole, we are losing grip on our cocoa industry. It's not the same in Africa. Something ought to be done in our motherland. So ministry in the city should be like this. You work to support. You work to support. But it should not be like this. Luke chapter 12. Ministry in the city should not be like what I'm going to read. Luke chapter 12 from verse 16. From verse 16. Now, are we together? Fine. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded 
an abundant harvest. The next verse. Any, no, verse 17, please. He thought to himself, the man thought he, to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Next verse. Then he said, this is what I would do. I will tear down my bands and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grains. Sometimes when you are in Accra and then you have, a, you have air conditioning, ceiling fan. Then he has gone to see another ceiling fan. Then he said, what do I do? I have money. Let's change the ceiling fans. Please, stop those changes. Because it is going to be at the expense of your brother. Yeah. This is what I will do. I will tear down my bands and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus gain, grains. The next verse. Then I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. In Accra, don't take life easy. Don't think that you have plenty for yourself. Eat, drink, take it easy. Please don't because of our central administration system. We are working for the common good. So work harder because of your brothers who do not have. Ministry in Greater Accra and the urban centers is serious business for the sake of the whole. It is not for the quest for position, promotion and backbiting. City ministry demands attention on your spiritual life because the fast life and the many side attractions in and around the city can cause you to lose your spiritual fervor. The opportunities can be a curse if not handled properly. So be careful of the city and work very hard. The Church of Pentecost and City Ministries. Today, by the grace of God, the Church of Pentecost is a leading denomination in this country and in the world. We have adapted successfully to the frontier environment and continue to grow. We just thank God for that. Shall we lift up our hands and bless the name of the Lord for his grace for the church. Now, by listening to this, it remains to be seen, however, how successfully we adapt to the urban environment of the present and future. It is quite clear from the statistics that the rural values, let me just take the word rural out, that the values which fostered success for us may well prove to be counterproductive as the society becomes increasingly urbanized. Do you, do you get that? Yeah. We need to understand the times and know that we should do and know what to do to stay relevant and stay on top to design a strategy to reach the urban areas. Are we together? Fine. Now, I now want to pay attention to rural values versus urban values. Frank Alt Lapo has said, and I quote, the farm is more than a place, it is a mindset, unquote. The same is true for the city. There is a rural psyche and an urban psyche. Now, it's a distinct way of thinking. Now, these two mindsets have different value systems which are often in conflict with each other. The conflict between rural and urban values is merely that of preference. Now, it is not a matter of which set of values is right or even better. The issue is more pragmatic than right or wrong. Rural values, but listen to this one, rural values work well in rural setting, and urban values work well in urban environment. Churches have tried to function in urban setting while retaining rural values. Now, so when you are functioning in Accra, 
You, you must be careful of retaining rural values because it will be counterproductive. The style of the church's operation is out of joint with the urban life. Not because it is more holy, no, but that it is more rural. I mean, the structure and the method is more rural. The clash between urban and rural values. Now, the status quo versus change. Status quo versus change. As chapter 10 from verse 9. As 10 from verse 9. Here we saw how God showed Peter a revelation. And then Peter, in verse 13, this is what the scripture says, verse 13. Then a voice told me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Let's listen to Peter, verse 14. Shall we all read 14 together? Surely not, Lord. Now, you cannot say surely not and add Lord. As for Lord, Lord should be obeyed. But Peter is confidently telling his Lord, Surely not. Now if you know that it is the Lord who will show you in this and the Lord say, kill and eat. Why is Peter saying, surely not, Lord? Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Surely not. Let's move on to 15. The voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made what? Lean. Now, this is Peter for you. Peter is holding on to some values, holding on to some teachings and ideas, and God is trying to break forth, take that thing out of him, and Peter is saying that, surely not. Surely not. And sometimes we sing, O quine da da ni mu, O quine da da ni mu, Erade, yene juma, and sometimes what you are saying that we want to just bring rural methods. It's not that when we say God, God works, we want to see the works of God as he did in the olden days. We are talking about walking in the pages of the book of Acts. Not carrying rural methods to the city. Not carrying rural methods to the city. Not at all. So in the rural areas, the status quo normally prevails. Things do not change much, but the city is different. Things change rapidly. Is that true? Yeah. Anytime that I go to our hometown, I see that there's not much changes. No. But when we were in East Legon for one, you travel out, you come about a week, and your vicinity has changed. So in the rural setting, people are used to the status quo. This is how we always do it. Because things do not change much, but in the cities, things change rapidly. The city church must learn to live with change. Our message is unchanging. The message is unchanging. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the methods in the cities should be flexible so that the city people will be able to receive our message. The changing trend also produces changing population. Changing population. So to stay relevant in the city, the church must be willing to embrace change. Must be willing to embrace change. We need to constantly ask ourselves, these questions. Number one, how can we improve? This is questions that all of us as a church should keep asking. Where am I now relative to where we are going? How can we improve? Question number two, how can we expand our ministry? How can we do that? Question number three, how do we meet the growing demand of change? How do we as a church 
pace with change. Now, the second value between um, the second difference, so far values are concerned between the rural and urban is this. Sameness versus diversity. Sameness versus diversity. Now the first one is status quo versus what? Change. The second one is sameness. Sameness is different from status quo. I will explain. Less in the city, the city is diverse. The ruler is same. Can you say that after me? The city is, the ruler is same. As chapter 2, verse 5. As chapter 2, verse 5. Shall we read together? Ready to go if you can. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from, from every nation under heaven. And then he started listening, list, listing where they had come from. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city, big city. And then he's saying that God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. In the city, they are, they are diverse. Diverse kinds of people. The things are diverse. But in the rural areas, it is same. Pentecost attracted Jews from all over the world to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the festival. Now, let's turn to Acts 17, verse 4. Acts 17, verse 4. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Let's go to 5. 5. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a rout in the city. Now, routes do not normally occur in rural areas because you cannot get mob around marketplace. The chief will crush them. Yeah, but you can get some in New York. You can get some at Carnation. You ask Apostle Asante. You can organize and rally some, some, some ruffians. Because in the city, there are a lot of Canaanites hiding. There. And you can get them. And so it is only in the city that you can get these things happen. Rural settlements are oriented not only towards status quo, but also towards sameness. Status quo is set against change. Status quo, they don't want to change. Now, while sameness is set against diverse, diversity. Now, what is diversity? The practice or quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic background and of different gender and sexual orientations. Diverse. You have all kinds of people meeting in the city. Now, in Accra, the typical Church of Pentecost congregation, you will find an AV in the, in the local assembly, an Akan is in the local assembly, uh, a Northna is in the local assembly, because we all converge here is diverse city. This year is election year. If you were in any part of Ghana, in the voter region, and you, the pastor, you, uh, you, you support the National Democratic Congress, and you lift the NDC flag, and you are running around, almost all your congregation will follow you. And nobody will say anything. When you are in my, my, my hometown, and then you support MPP, and then you lift the MPP flag, and you are running, 99.9 .9 will follow you. Because these are Ashanti people, 
and they vote normally for MPP and the votarians vote normally for the NDC. But go and do the same at Kaswa. You will be surprised how much more trying it at PRWC Atomic. Now, you would not finish. Somebody will take a picture of you and then forward it to me. Yeah. You, you, you anoint somebody and they'll forward it to me. When we, we will bring you to the office and we'll ask you, what flag were you holding? Oh, I was, not, I was not holding any flag. Oh, these people, they will show you your picture. Yeah. Listen, because in the city, there, there is diversity. If you belong to any political divide, hide it. Because your vote is one. So you don't play politics in the city. Because you will be offending a church member unknowingly. And some of them, they are called Kwesi Kwejo, but they are Votarians. And they are from the northern region. And so don't just, the name Mensa is Ada Akan or whatever. And so I even know some Northerners who are called Mensa if you are in Ghana. And so you may never know who is sitting in your congregation. So ministry in the city is a bit different from rural. Have I communicated? Fine. So because of the diversity, we should find within the local church a tolerance and an appreciation for diversity. Yeah. So give space. If you see a Votarian and you, you are an Akan, that is your brother in the Lord. When you see a Notna and you are also a Votarian, that is your brother in the Lord. You are a Chim, that is your brother, a guy, that is your brother. And so you find such things in the city where you can have divers. Now you are worshipping in the city. Somebody may not even be a Ghanaian and they are part of your congregation. So let's move on. The slowness of change to respond to diversity inherent in the Great Commission is nothing new. The book of us is filled with examples of such. As 15, circumcision. Moving away from circumcision was a battle. They had to argue and it has to be settled in Jerusalem. Even that did not stop it. Paul had to educate and educate and educate. And because of that, they wanted to kill him. Now, let's move on. Smallness versus bigness. In the rural setting, it's smallness. But in the cities, it is bigness. Let's go to Genesis 1 verse 4. Genesis 1 verse 4. Are you understanding me? Uh, let me see your hand if you are. Uh, I'm sure you are thinking. Eh? And then waiting for my conclusion. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some conclusions. So let's read no, Genesis 11 verse 4. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a, no, not a village, with a tower that reaches to the heavens. In the city, we are talking about towers that reaches to heavens, bigness, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Verse 5, but the Lord came down to see their city and the tower the people were building. So that you see in the city, they are looking at bigness. People prefer the countryside or the small towns because they value smallness. There are certain people who want to just stay in their corner. To many of such people, bigness is a threat. They feel they, they lose control when things become big. The city, on the other hand, is geared towards bigness. Big shopping center, big vehicles, big buildings, big congregation. In the city, anonymity is normal. You see, when you are 
let's say in Accra or in London or in any big city in the world, even your next door neighbor, you hardly talk to the fellow. Everybody is busy. You don't even see them. So when you go to PIWC and the people are there, and sometimes you can have about 60 elders, and we say that, look at the elders. Ah, oh, what a waste. That is where they want to worship. These are intellectuals. If it were a waste for them, they would have left the church. You see, because they don't care whether people know them or not. Because in the city, how many people know you? So, when people are hiding in, in the crowd, in the church, it is normal in the city. So, if you want to do effective follow-up, break it into small groups so that we can be able to mind them. Now, to be a very effective pastor in the city, now, this is what you ought to do. Because many a times, you cannot roam around all oh, your, 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 your parishness. When I was in PIWC for one, our cell group, it spanned from Tema to Kaswa and beyond. Cell meetings. And sometimes in the evening, if I have to go to Kaswa cell, by the time I come home, I've traveled. If I had even had to go to Kumasi, I would have read Kumasi. Because the traffic and all that. That is city church. Now, you have to be an effective preacher. Very good preacher. When you are in the city. Because you must preach and your word should reach them and change them. And then you must also devise some modern gadgets to reach these people. And then break the church into smaller squads so that majority of the people will be touched. Majority of the people will be touched. Are we together? Fine. This is very important for me. So please, let's pay attention. The church in the city cannot afford to be valuing smallness. No. When a church thinks small, when a church thinks more than, it is certainly out of tune with the environment in the city. Bigness also means taste for quality. We are not just talking about build a big, magnificent house. It must be of quality. When people see a church in the city, they should see that this church building is in the city. And so when you come to the city, let the architects design. Let the architects design. Don't say, oh, when you were in Jokobu, uh, we, built, we, built, we built a very nice one. Oh, uh, oh the, the brother, he, did, he didn't take anything. He did it for us for free. So, okay, I'm going to bring him. You go and bring a draftsman. Here, we talk about architects, proper ones. When they are designing and you are a pastor, don't go instructing. You are a preacher. You are not an architect. So here, you have to be careful. The way you interfere with committees and all that, you have to be, because on your committee are intellectuals, people who can manage estate. So don't just go interfering. You read your Bible and pray every day. So you can grow. And then leave them to do their work. Support them. Here, interference is unacceptable. Here, we deal with policies and things must work. Please pay attention. Let me take some time because we are talking about the future. So, quality and bigness calls for great preparation and input. Here, we talk about quality and bigness. And quality and bigness calls for great preparation. Look at the Tower of Babel. Great preparation they made. And they were all one. They want to build something to the sky. Now, let's go to 1 Chronicles 22, 5. 1 Chronicles 22, 5. David said, My son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all the nations. The house that they are going to build, it says that it should be of what? Great magnificence, fame, splendor in the sight of the nations. 
Now, I like the last line. Let's read the last line together if you can. Therefore, I will make preparation for it. In the city, we are talking about quality. The service must be quality. So the pastor must make great preparation for it. The seating arrangement, the chairs that people sit on. When Queen Sheba went to Solomon and he saw the, the sitting of his officials, even the place they ate from, the golden spoons and the arrangement, the queen said, you are far exceeded what I have heard about you. Your wisdom is great. Here yeah, we need great wisdom to manage city churches. I'm not saying that we don't need saving for the rural, but here we are talking about quality and bigness. Are we together? Fine. Harmony versus conflict. Harmony versus conflict. Genesis 19 verse 4. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, of what? The city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Now you know the story. But men, homosexuals, they are not plenty in the rural areas. If the chief of your village tends to know that somebody is homosexual, sometimes they even ban the person from there. But in the cities, they are canonized hiding. Yeah. City people realize there is no single way defined social order. The city is a melting pot containing more than one of such values, more than one culture. In the city, it is more than one culture. It is a place where values and cultures merge. You remember the video that we showed you? The one the lady was knocked down by the vehicle. You see that this, this usher, this usher, she will look at your dress, and then if the dress is like what they used to wear, says, oh, brother, you are welcome. Sister, you are welcome. And then this girl came, city girl. Where do you think you are going? Now, that is where the conflict is. In the city, people will come to your church dressed like a lady. Don't say, where do you think you are going? Manage the conflict. We manage the conflict. Manage the conflict. We have to learn to dwell together. Because people will come to church like that. With tattered jeans, what do you do? Do you sack them? You have to manage the conflict. Let them come in. And little by little, help people like this. To become like Christ. Have I communicated? In the city we must learn to manage conflict. Not eliminating conflict. Or escalating tension. You can't eliminate conflict in the city. So don't escalate tension. Don't be using remarks that will create tension. Please. Try and live with um, the difference. The, the different things that you see. Now. We also have. Established versus mobile. In the rural settings, mostly things are established. But in the cities, uh, there is a lot of mobility. As chapter 8, from verse 27. As 8, 27. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. An important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kande, which means queen of, of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah. All that distance to Jerusalem from Ethiopia. If he didn't have a chariot. Eh? So he drove in his chariot to Jerusalem. And he's coming back in his chariot. Now. In the rural setting. One does not need. To travel extensively. Or often except under. Special circumstances. So the church is just close by. His house. 
they walk to church. In the city, however, mobility is the way of life. Perhaps in the city, perhaps in the city, perhaps in the city will continue, people in, people in the city will continue to pass several churches until they get to the one they want to attend. And so when even you are in Accra and your district is somewhere beyond uh, downtown, getting to Bogia, so that's where your district is. And then somebody who worships in Kanishi has built his house uh, close by your, your chapel. Don't go to this member and say that, see, you are suffering too much. Eh? All this fuel that you are wasting in the city, people don't care. Because on Monday, they are going to leave that house and go to Accra Central anyway. So if they are going to Kaneshi, it's halfway. Yeah. And then they do that all week. So adding the Sunday is not a burden to people in the city. Have I communicated? Why? And most often, that it, because, it is also because there is mobility. At least there is there's transport. If he doesn't have a vehicle on his on, it, on its own, there is some government transport or transportation is available. They can move and come back. And so we have established against mobile. Chances are that there is improved public transport for those in the city and those who do not even have vehicles. City churches need leaders who think as city people. And this is my last point. And this is my conclusion. This one listening to me well. I went to a certain church. And then, in the city, then the pastor, whilst the service has started, he said, okay, those of you who are joining us for the first time, the toilet is here. And, and the washrooms are here. If you go out and you pass, you say, oh, wait now. This is rural. Now, you don't do that in the city. Let the ashes direct where the washrooms are. You don't use the lecterns. Don't stand behind the lectern and be directing people where they have to go to the toilet. No. So, the city church needs people who are city leaders. Don't just pick anybody because the person can pray and shout, no. Find people who understand city life so that they will be able to lead the church well. You see, in the cities are leaders. And leaders hate to follow people who are not leaders. And so please, let's pay attention to this one. Yesterday, I said that when Barnabas went to Antioch, and he saw the grace of God, he went to fetch Paul because he knows that this man will be able to handle the church in Antioch. So let's look for people who will be able to handle the church well. A bunch that is in tune with his environment will be accustomed to change, diversity, bigness, and mobility. Leaders of the city church should not ma maintain the rural values of the status quo, sameness, smallness and inertia in the churches or perhaps they really do not want these rural values but because they have been in the city for so long many think that let me say because they have been in the church for so long many think that they must somehow be scriptural and for that matter, spiritual. So they hold on to it. When we dominate city churches with rural values, the churches will not grow. And we'll be losing especially our young people. They will not fight you, but they will live quietly. And no amount of words can keep young people when they think that they are not comfortable with what you are doing. So city churches need city leaders. Now, so when we are 
locating a church in the city, locate it properly. Pitch it at a place where there is accessibility and a place that you know it can grow. Locate it well. And then, punctuality. In the city, punctuality is key. Because people are busy. You cannot walk into the church anytime you want as a pastor. If you think we are starting church at 8, 8 o'clock, or even before, be there. If you are closing at 11, 11, close. Yesterday I spoke a lot about that. But I just don't want you to rush through service. Please, let us have quality service and manage the time well. There was this pastor who felt that one of his presiding elders kept too long in church. And so he told me that on Sunday I'll go there and show you how, how to do church. And so after the church service on Sunday, I called him. Those days I was also a pastor. I said, so what happened? So I've taught them how to do church. See, any away. Now we just finish. Hey, don't just go and finish. Now, make sure that people receive something before they go home. Quality word. Quality word. So, in, in, in the rural areas, uh, please give me time, man. Eh? Yeah. Don't say go and sit down, go and sit down. I'm not going. <laughs> If you tell me to sit down, I will not go. Now, let's have those of you on the second row, uh, please come. Those of you on the second row, yeah. Shall we put our hands together for them? <laughs> Typical Sunday morning in the rural church. All of you have testimonies. Come, 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 come. And they all come and line up. What are you going to testify about? He says that I was going to the farm and then I heard something. Then I jumped and by the grace of God, it was a snake. Snake. Then this one will come. Rabbit. And we are just wasting time over snakes. These are not testimonies. Snakes are in the rural areas. So if you saw one and you jumped, this is the testimony. But in the rural setting, we would we will let all of them tell their stories. By the time they finish, it is a waste of time. But in the urban setting, if you really want to give a testimony, write. Listen to the testimony. See if it will profit the congregation. So you call out names. Or don't be taking testimonies every Sunday because you don't have time. So shift your testimonies to a particular Sunday where you give a lot more people space and then make sure that your sermon is sermonette. Now, if it is prayer meeting, give one hour to prayer, the sermon 15 minutes and other things you manage within the two hours. But if you want to jam everything like you used to do when you were in Lonto and now you are in Accra Central and you are still doing it, you will destroy our church. Have I communicated? So your testimony is about what? <laughs> you better sit down. He said, I was eating fufu, and then something pricked me. I said, hey, something has pricked me. He said, well, I <laughs> Announcements. Announcements. Come, 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 come. You are a big man. This is announcement time. He is a secretary. Please come and stand here. He is a local secretary. He comes and he is reading the announcement from pieces of paper. You see, the announcement book is tenable to court. Yeah. Don't read from pieces of paper. Because one day, the court may call for the announcement book. So, don't be doing that. And whilst he's giving the announcement, person, come, come, come. This is another elder. So you give your announcement. And then, <laughs> and then this one will come and whisper something to his ears. Then another elder will come and whisper something to you, sir. 
after they've done all these rural things, then you go and sit down. Then the pastor will come and start the announcement all over. Yeah. All over. And then if God does not help us, and in that meeting the area head is there, you come, praise the Lord. And yes, did you hear the announcement? I think I have to do it well. Now the area head comes and he, the announcement alone takes about one hour. This is rural. Now if we keep doing these things in the city churches, we may be losing out on the future. So city churches calls for city leaders. So please, and then the seating arrangement. We can no longer be separating women from men in the city. What will be the explanation you are going to give to them? How many of you have sat in a classroom before? Classroom. If you have not sat in a classroom, don't worry. Where the women at one, the girls at one side and the boys at one side. How many of you have sat in a passenger vehicle before? Where the women at one side, where the men at one side, why do you do that in a city church? Why? Some of these things, we have to change them. Because the Holy Spirit will still work amongst us. But don't let us transport rural issues to um, the urban centers. And then, okay, let me end. The janitorials, what the other the pastor said, the toilets. Now, when you enter any toilet room or washroom in the city, you must know that this is a city. Sometimes, you, I even myself, excuse my language, I went somewhere and I wanted to pass water. So they took me, or they showed me where to go. And then when I opened the door, I had to backtrack. See you. Ah, the stench. I said, ah, and pastor, you took me there. Anyway, I can't blame him. Maybe he just came from... Yeah. But because, and he's transporting that... Listen, when you are a pastor, be, be concerned about everything in the city. Everything in the city. If the people are sitting on plastic chairs and they are breaking, don't say, oh, as for plastic chairs, they have been breaking. Even when I was at Ascari, they were breaking. Change the plastic chairs. Give them seats that will fit city church. It is a losing proposition to, ask, to be asked to function in the city with lay or professional leadership that wants the church to be the last bastion of rural values. I have attempted to underscore the importance of city ministry and how we should adapt to the challenges of the city to continue to stay relevant and effective in the coming years as more and more people move into the city it behoves on the church to continue to expand its vision to meet the challenges of the city to stay relevant and sustainable have i communicated fine so i'll end here but i'll keep pushing this agenda if God grants me the grace. And so what we are going to do moving forward is not to allow one pastor to pastor many churches in the city. No. Because we want quality service. Quality service. My local assembly, the English church is over 600. And I'm not exaggerating. When they meet, they can have about 600 people. So the English church alone is a big church. And then when you come to the local church, the Akan Assembly, they are over 2,000. On a typical good Sunday, they can have about 1,000 plus people coming to church. Now, 1,000 people for a minister should be enough. If you add the 600, it should be enough. There is no need to add another assembly. Because the more assemblies that we have on our, in our hands as a pastor, 
we will be compromising on quality. Is that right? Fine. And then when we build the churches well, the big fishes will come out of the churches we have built. And people also want to contact pastors. Our elders do not also have the time. So if our churches are only going to be manned by elders and the pastor is seldom seen, we are not going to have an effective church moving forward. Our elders will support us. They will continue to do that. They are not saying they are tired. But when we reduce the number of assemblies, there will be much more effective supervision than a lot more of them and then once in a while they see you. To be continued, shall we rise to our feet?